President Cyril Ramaphosa delivered his last State of the Nation address at the Cape Town City Hall in the Western Cape last night. This was the last sauna of the sixth administration and the president's last sauna before the general elections. Now, now in his speech, Ramaphosa started by highlighting some of South Africa's issues, essentially blaming the state capture for the problems. There have also been times when events at home have shaken the foundations of our constitutional democracy. Perhaps the greatest damage was caused during the era of state capture. For a decade, individuals at the highest levels of the state conspired with private individuals to take over and repurpose state-owned enterprises, law enforcement agencies, and other public institutions. In some cases, these activities were enabled by local and multinational companies. Billions of rands that were meant to meet the needs of ordinary South Africans were stolen. Confidence in our country was badly eroded. Public institutions were severely weakened. The effects of state capture continue to be felt across society, from the shortage of freight locomotives to crumbling public services, from poor performance of our power stations to failed development projects in a number of places. But South Africans, including many honest and dedicated public servants, fought back and worked together to defeat state capture. One of the issues that the country is faced with, the President Cyril Ramaphosa touched on the matter of gender-based violence and femicide, which has been characterized as the country's second pandemic. He says government has put measures in place to address the crisis, calling on collaborative societal efforts to tackle GBV and femicide. Another major challenge we had to address during this period is gender-based violence and femicide, which we characterized as the second pandemic. As the government, we have introduced laws and directed more resources to prosecuting perpetrators, providing better support to survivors, and promoting women's empowerment at an economic level. As a society, we must intensify our collective efforts to bring together various efforts that are going to bring gender-based violence and femicide to an end. Furthermore, the president spoke about what many were looking forward to hearing being spoken about, which is the issue of load shedding. Ramaphosa promises that worst of load shedding is behind us and the end of power cuts is within reach. We set out a clear plan to end load shedding, which we have been implementing with a single-minded focus through the National Energy Crisis Committee. We have delivered on our commitments to bring substantial new power through private investment on the grid, which is already helping to reduce load shedding. Last year, we implemented a major debt relief package, which will enable ESCOM to make investments in maintenance and transmission infrastructure and ensure its sustainability going forward. Since we revived our renewable energy program five years ago, we have connected more than 2,500 megawatts of solar and wind power to the grid, with three times this amount already in procurement or construction. Through tax incentives and financial support, we have more than doubled the amount of rooftop solar capacity installed across the country in just the past year. We have implemented sweeping regulatory reforms to enable private investment 
in electricity generation with more than 120 new private energy projects that are now in development. These are phenomenal developments that are driving the restructuring of our electricity sector in line with many other economies have done to increase competitiveness and to bring down their energy prices. Through all these actions, we are confident that the worst is behind us and the end of load shedding is finally within reach. In addition, the president detailed the fictional story of a child of democracy named Dinsualo, whose life has been improved by 30 years of the African National Congress governance. The story portrays how the government has transformed the lives of millions of South Africans by providing access to necessities of life such as houses, electricity, education, nutrition, social support grants and employment opportunities. The story of the first 30 years of our democracy can best be told through a number of initiatives that have been embarked upon in the 30 years. But I think that the story can best be told through the life of a child who was born at the dawn of our democracy called Dinsualo. Dinsualo and many others born at the same time as her were beneficiaries of the first policies of the democratic state to provide free health care for pregnant women and children under the age of six. Tinsualov's formative years were spent in a house provided by the state, one of millions of houses built to shelter the poor. Tinsualo grew up in a household provided with basic water and electricity in a house where her parents were likely to have lived without electricity before 1994. Tinsualo was enrolled in a school in which her parents did not have to pay school fees. And each school day, she received nutritious meals as part of a program that today, the program that today supports nine million learners from poor families. The Democratic State provided a child support grant to meet Tinsualo's basic needs. This grant together with other forms of social assistance, continues to be a lifeline for more than 26 million South Africans every month. With this support, Tinsualo, democracy's child, was able to complete high school. Through the assistance of the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, Tinsualo attended one of our TIVET colleges and obtained a qualification. When Tinsualo entered the world of work, she was able to progress and thrive with the support of the state's employment equity and black economic empowerment policies. With the income she earned, she was able to save she was also able to support her parents. She was able to start a family, to move into a better house, and to live a better life. 